Hello, everybody, and welcome to this wonderful oh. list of Thursdays. Let's see. Uh, do I have all my boxes checked? Can you tap, tap, tap? Is this thing on? Chat? I think you can hear me. I hope you can hear me. Um, do we exist? Yes. Do, do we exist? Do we? Please, yes, exist. Maybe. Hey, we're playing around with a little bit of stuff. A few of you got a little sneak peek of <laughs> of me, uh, <laughs> have, you know, with my pants down a little bit. Well, metaphorically, uh, here here before the stream. Um, what's up, chat? What's up, Odysseus? What's up, Vincent? Uh, we are back for another episode of the Party Invite Show. This week, we've been playing around. So, uh, last week, we only had what we've been playing. This week, we'll only have uh, a party topic. So if you were here for last week's episode, you heard us talk about um, essentially what we decided to talk about today. We wanted to talk about the state of game reviews uh, because Starfield came out, Armored Core 6 has come out, Baldur's Gate 3 has come out, and Sea of Stars has come out. All of them have come out uh, to pretty good reviews, which is great. It's a really good time to be playing video games right now. Not to mention all the other stuff on our backlog, but uh, we'll get to the topic here in a minute. My name is Tegan. For anybody who's new here, I'm joined, as usual, by the one and only Vilos. Oh, yeah, that's me. That's cool. you. And the one and only Sovereign Sid. Hello! Hello! So, uh, you know, how's it going? How's it going, guys? <laughs> uh, what you been up to? How's the game life treating you? Do these pigtails make me look e-girl? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's basically like asking, does vision make me look at <laughs> Uh Let's see. So we're, uh, yeah, we're uh, going to start the show with a good old uh, blissin' up, y'all. Something that's uh, something that made us smile in the past week or so. Uh, Chad, if you'd like to tell us uh, here on Twitch or on our Discord, on any of our socials, something that made you smile, gaming or non-gaming, we always love to hear it. And if you give us permission to read it on the show, we would love to share it with the world. Uh Let's see, what do we what do we got first? Who wants to go first? Not me. Hmm? Oops, sorry, I was chewing pepperoni. But oh, I can go course. first. <laughs> well, we might want to say what this part of what this segment of the show is. No, right? that's yeah. not that doesn't make Maybe. any sense. I Maybe. don't think we should um no. Mm. We should be as inaccessible mm. to new viewers as possible. That's mm. our mission statement here at Party Invite. Um I've always said that. Uh, but you know what? Maybe we'll switch things up this time. Uh, so our Blissin' Up segment is just to uh, give us something positive to to start the show off on, right? Um, a little something that, uh, you know, in a, in a world, in an internet where it can be hard to, well, it can be easy to find things that can make you upset. We want to give you something that'll make you smile. Um, you know, so, uh, you know what? Actually, I'll start off real quick. Uh, I know we're not doing what we've been playing. Yeah, I'm jumping in because neither you did. So here I am. Get wrecked. Uh, I will say that I started Starfield last night and, it, you know, I'm barely into the tutorial. I don't, you know, I haven't played long enough to have any strong opinions on um, what I've seen so far. What I will say is uh, in the tutorial, you know, you're like, hey, there's stuff happening. Oh, geez, some bad guys showed up. Pick up a weapon and press this button to shoot, you know. Well, I killed my very first enemy. The first enemy in the whole game, they dropped a legendary weapon. A fucking legendary weapon y'all wow and privilege. i i glossed over it i was streaming to discord and lord chrome is like yo are you just gonna gloss over the fact that you just got a legendary and i was like was that not scripted i just assumed i got the legendary it thing because it was, it was a completely random drop completely random drop <laughs> well so uh you know that gives me that energy i need to to go into the into this weekend you know the other thing, uh, which is very similar, was that uh, I, I didn't mention this, but a week or so ago in Diablo 4, uh, my partner Lizzie and I were playing online and um, we, you know, we're playing with each other online, but when you're in especially certain areas of the game, other players will appear and you can interact with them, interact with them in different ways. You can emote, you can type in chat, stuff like that. Uh, well, some stranger walked up and gave me 750,000 gold just for no reason, you know, just cause, um, and you know, you don't have to know much about the game to know that to a low level character, 750,000 gold is a lot of mo is a lot of gold. It's a lot of money. So, uh, yeah, we haven't had to worry about money since then. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> So how does it feel winning the lottery? Well, I'm gonna I'm, right after the show. I'm going down the street to uh, pick up a ticket. <laughs> Make sure to take Lizzie with you. Oh, I will. 
Uh, <laughs> Both of you combined are just two. Yeah, she had the, the PS5 luck. Her superpower is uh, the ability to check her own emails. Well, to check her emails in a timely fashion. Um, anyway, so so I got a big kick out of those. I, I forgot to share the, the Diablo 4 one last week, so I'm glad I could <laughs> get that off my chest. But it just cracked me up getting that lucky right at the start of my Starfield run, especially since I was specifically planning to have my character only use melee and lasers. And I got a weapon that's neither of those things. <laughs> but I have to use it now. You know, I can't... Well, whatever. You'll see uh, when we play Starfield after the podcast here, um, I saved my game right before I got to my first, like, real, like, the next combat experience. So we're going to see how well that uh, gun works. Because I don't know. I don't know yet. Everybody was dead by the time I picked it up. So... Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's that's what that's what I've been smiling about. <laughs> uh, how about you guys? Yeah. Uh, as for me, I completed Sea of Stars instead of doing more Starfield over the weekend. So uh, that was a solid twenty-five hours because I had played five hours beforehand. So uh, spent twenty-five hours between Saturday and Monday uh, getting through Sea of Stars, and it was a great time. Uh, it's it's such a fantastic game, and I'll I'll definitely talk about talk more about it uh, next week. Um, it was really great having Demo Duo do the Sea of Stars demo as well, because um, there's there's plenty for newcomers to uh, to see in Sea of Stars, and it's very hard to not spoil things. But mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, uh, like the the game is such a, a quality experience that uh, a lot of things are intuitive, but you kind of, as somebody that knows the the furthest levels of the game and the deepest like uh, knowledge, like the little the little memory and the the little nods to other games and stuff like that, just make it such a, a special experience. So if you if you miss any of those things that the that the developers put in there very purposefully, um, it it kind of detracts a little bit from the experience. So it's like it's like, hey, did you did you see this yet? Mm -hmm. And the player would be like, "No," and it's like, "Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you more about it when you get there." <laughs> like, it's really nice to to see other people play it um, and be able to uh, talk to them uh, through some really special points. Like <laughs> you see, yeah, you see the, on uh... screen on the on the stream right now. Um, about halfway, a little bit over halfway through the game, uh, you get access to the the crypt, which is actually uh, the place. Besides the credits of the game, which are extensive, the crypt is actually the place where Kickstarter backers of different levels actually have in-game oh, that's fun things uh, that are attributed to them. As you see there, uh, there's a little code. That's what the the backer actually gets a code uh, directly from the the devs, and they got to uh, put their own little spin on the line that's there. So I got 99 problems, but losing a life ain't one foggy. <laughs> so they, they dedicated their, their little crypt line to, uh, to their cat and <laughs> sabotage studio, obviously loved the, the image of the cat that they gave, I guess. And, and I guess that was a, it was one of the very sp specific backer levels that gets that kind of, uh, statue in the game. Otherwise they're just like little, um, little gravestone sort of things, but there's so many, so 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 many yeah but what a wonderful to way crypt. to commemorate your backers though right to yeah you know because like you can put people in the credits and then have a huge long list of credits and that is cool to see your name up there i'm sure it would be i haven't you know ever done that myself it's but cool. to have like this optional thing and i think we were just i was just having this conversation i think in the past week or two about how um there aren't enough modern games that have the good old gravestone jokes anymore that used to be in my head, at least, that used to be a pretty common thing. Um, you know, of course, I remember Fable having lots of good ones, lots of jokes. Uh, I think Dead Cells has a lot of, like, good, like, gravestone. I mean, there aren't any stones where the corpses are, but, like, usually you, like, look at them and they'll be, like, like the the prisoner will say something, like, mm -hmm. funny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with this, there's, I don't know the official number, but there's at least 300 to 500 uh, wow. backer stones just in the in the crypt itself wow that I, is a I, lot yeah i looked for about an hour at different ones and i i took so many more screenshots uh and i was just like okay i'll come back to this because ah! i got half the game left to go and <laughs> it was really funny and it's it's just a very chill part of the game that you can come back to anytime 
Uh, it's really great. Like you saw one of the other channels that put the here lies the economy <laughs> one. Like <laughs> there's some really great jokes that some of these backers put in, into into this. So uh, it, Sea of Stars is a, a game that just keeps giving right now. That's awesome. I think games are like the companies that do the backing things like that are like really cool. Like the a lot of the monster taming ones, you get to like either you know design a monster or name a monster or you can be like an NPC in the world or um, you just get like uh, some kind of, you know, notoriety like that. I think that's really cool. Um, just to see yourself in like as the tiniest element in a game, I think it's just the bees knees. Cause then you can play the game and be like, that's me. Look at that. Right. I, I mean, and Gerard, the completionist has an actual character in this game. Really? Yeah. Uh, like the completionist as in like the beard guy. Yeah. With the beard. Yes. That's not that, that's what he's known for. He's not known for completing all the games. He's, just, <laughs> he's known for the beard. <laughs> he's he's uh, the completionist. <laughs> uh, you, you actually meet his his character almost the same time that you get this crypt access, and uh, he's Gerard the constructionist. Um, oh. Ooh. A really really great thing, and he's actually in, he's um, actually. Man, I wish I would have known about that part of the gameplay backing so. feature because like I'm trying to get my name out there too. Because you you <laughs> well, know I'm in Cormon well, as the as the NPC. Be, so. Yeah, right, for sure. Uh, he was definitely a backer, but he's also friends with somebody on the dev team that got him there. So it's, Oh, it's whole, okay. Whole so thing. it doesn't involve me giving up my avocado toast. It involves my parents buying the house for me. Got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's your end. Um, so, wait, my end for what? No, <laughs> my listen up is um, actually about me. Uh, speaking of me, uh, my return to streaming last week was... A phenomenal success, and I'm super, super happy about it. Um, all of my people that have just been like supporting me from the beginning came back, and you know, it was like a big old party, a big old reunion. It was kind of teary, it was kind of happy, and it kind of just felt like I didn't stop for like two or three months or however long I was gone. <laughs> yeah, that's good. But there was a big major change. Um, besides the fact that I actually started at a reasonable time where people were awake and could watch me. That's wild. <laughs> right? Like I was I was live before 11 p.m. Look at that. That's um, who are you? I I am Obsidianite now. Ha ha. That's who I am. So um, a lot of people wondered where the Sid and Sovereign Sid came from. And it's not my real name. Um, you know, people call me like Sydney and whatnot. Um, even though I made like all of my NPC characters named Sydney based off of that. Uh, Sid actually comes from Obsidianite, which is like my OG original handle back when I like started creating content and whatnot and um and a desire to reclaim that and also like establish a brand that I could actually like be like I won't have to like fight for URLs to get like a website and like mm -hmm. I'll still I'll still be the whole first page of Google when you look at me up or whatever but like now my name is like my name I don't have to fight with like 50 other sovereigns in the world you know what I mean yeah um so and and I don't have to worry about whenever I start like a new MMO or like something like that. Oh, is Sovereign taken? Of course it is, because it's the word the dictionary. Now I could just oh, that's my name. Do, do, do. So that was that was mainly the reason um, of the reversion back to my my old OG name. But honestly, I just missed it. I missed it, and it's it's fun. It's a way to break away from like that black peach persona that I have so encompassed all, over the years, um, while still retaining the original charm that makes me me. So that's what made me happy this week. Is that everyone um, in the community and the sovereignty, which is still going to be called the sovereignty. Um, the sovereign is more like a moniker now than it is a handle. Um, you know, all of the love and support was still there. Like I'd never left. And it was like one big family. And I couldn't be happier that I built such a loving and supportive community yeah, and continue cool. to. Yeah. Well, I'm happy for you. Yeah, that was great. Uh, I know I was able to tune in for a little bit there. Uh, well, I mean, I played with you on uh, Overwatch, of course, but, um, you know, it was good to be back. I saw I saw you went live yesterday. What you uh What you do yesterday? Was that Was that two days ago? Uh, well, gosh, was it? Time is an enigma. Like <laughs> asking me one time, it is always like, oh, it's February o'clock. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the other day, or whenever I streamed, it was I jumped back into Pokemon Unite, and um, I did some more story elements of Splatoon three, which I still need to finish. Um, I'm really looking forward to finally seeing how that ends. Even though the game's been out for a year, it's celebrating its year anniversary. Um, you know, as of the sixth, or not the sixth. What was last Friday? Last Thursday, I mean, the first. Uh, the yeah, yeah. Yep, that sounds right. Last Friday, it came out on the first. Okay. Anyway, it's celebrating its anniversary, and um, 
So I, I really want to complete the storyline and see, you know, after so long, what's going on with with that world. Yeah. Especially because the new DLC will be coming out sometime this year, I think, uh, Side Order, which is going to be a new DLC campaign. Nice. Uh, well, let's see. We got uh, Benson in chat. I, I said I'd read stuff if people put it in, so I'm going to do that right now. Uh, Benson said, I made it to ultimate rank in Unite right for the end of the season and got a neat cosmetic item. Oh yeah. I was proud of my cosmetic items when we played Halo Infinite the other day. Completed that first battle pass after forever, you know. Uh, those cosmetics feel good. So well, like, this one was, like, spec like, really, really cool because... For those who know Benson, he's got like this really like signature hairstyle. And it's not something that you see very commonly, like in a customization, like in a game or anything like that. But it's like really cool. And this is basically that hairstyle. Nice. So it's like the closest the closest representation of that hairstyle that any com like, you know, customization could possibly get. And it's in a Pokemon Unite game, which is so like some offshoot of like this really big franchise, like with a with a offshoot genre like so it's fun it's fun that is fun uh wonderful well if you all have uh more things that you'd like me to read here on the show i can do that before the end so make sure you get into the chat uh otherwise i guess we better uh jump into this topic huh i listen i listened to uh well well i i'll just say i did a lot of homework this week a lot more homework than i've done in a while that's uh, right no free ads <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty, yeah, I will. I will actually shout out some uh, some good resources throughout our conversation here. But uh, Vilas, do you want to kick things off? Yeah, and so tonight, really, we wanted to get into some modern game reviews after last week's uh, brief. Uh, what we've been playing kind of got us into that mode. We're like, wait a second, we should we should talk about this later. Um, so modern game reviews and the Discord around them, or discourse around them, has transformed. Uh, to be some really harmful, toxic stuff. The the environment is just not great. And right now it's rearing its ugly head uh, over the past month and a half where some of these some of the best games that we've had in a very long time are are coming out. Um and it's it's hard right now to find the right places to uh to get a review because all we really want is to get more insight on potential games that we want to play with all this endless advertising and cash grabs and social media marketing money and all this BS around us and thousands of potential games to buy, right? Yeah. We don't have that kind of money. We try. Some of us do unfortunate financial things to <laughs> play the games we have. But, you know, at, at the end of the uh, day... Chad, if you've done anything unfortunate <laughs> for game money, uh, let's go in the chat. Get in the chat. If, you, if you've been personally victimized by gaming culture... <laughs> <laughs> yes. For money, uh, you you could be entitled to a settlement. <laughs> oh my god, we're gonna get on as a part of that Steam refund ad yeah, that's right. always. Called. Um, but reviews have always been a major contributor to games successes, uh, and over the past few years, it's kind of been one to one. Like if you see a review and it's it's a hit, like that game is making the sales. It's very rare these days that a, that a game is critically received extremely well and does not get get sales. Uh, when uh, somebody... Unless you work for... What's the yeah. company? Unless you work for the people who made Dishonored. Because <laughs> those games are like really highly critically acclaimed, but then they just... Nobody buys them. Nobody Listen, likes that's, the that, game. That's also, that's also Bethesda. Oh, oh that is Bethesda. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to get into that. Um... <laughs> But uh, right now, uh, some of the loudest voices that we that we see across the web have kind of co-opted reviews, done a lot of stuff like uh, talk down outlets and validating opinions, uh, and even spreading misinformation before a game's release. Uh, and we're going to get into some of those topics uh, as we go along here. Um, but one of one of the things we wanted to start off with was to to get some of the positives here out for you. So. Uh, some of the strengths that are in the way that reviews are currently being run right now, um, for one, um, content creators and review outlets are getting access to games a lot earlier than they used to. So they are not getting a game that's 70 to 100 hours long, like five days before release, <laughs> and and trying to trying get to their content out before yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I, I played for, for 40 hours. I haven't slept, and I'm going to write this review. I'm sure it's going to be a real <laughs> banger. 
<laughs> me when Pokemon yes. Unite came out in beta. Like, <laughs> and so the the timing of things is is helpful now. Like we're getting embargoes uh, like a couple of weeks uh, these days, a couple of weeks before official release. Now, um, the other thing is that with the proliferation of uh, social media and uh, channels like Twitch and YouTube and stuff like that, the algorithms that have been put together they do grab enough information from what you've been searching and what you've been asking for to get you a pretty curated chunk and a, a very uh, a very good potential list of places to watch in order to find your favorite content. So you do have options to find the people that match with your personal uh, preferences. Because, yeah. you know, the, the thing is that you know, if you're looking at, at Rolling Stone, it's like, oh, I, I do, I listen to, uh, or I read Rolling Stone articles because I, I want to hear about this band or this band. That's the only reason I go there. And then they come in with, with reviews. You're like, but it, is that is that a place I want to want to get game reviews from? You know, so it's it's really about uh, picking you know, and choosing. NPR, uh, actually, the first uh, the first review I read from Starfield at all, just because it's the first thing I saw when I opened my phone. Uh, the first Starfield review I saw was from NPR. And so I was like, you know what? Here we go. This is not my that normal gaming outlet, <laughs> but uh, but it was a good article, you know? Mm-hmm. And it it uh, was a great place to start um, as reviews rolled out for everyone else because it gave me, you know, I trust NPR as an outlet. I didn't recognize the author, but I wouldn't recognize most authors on most websites I trust, you know, <laughs> because I don't... Um, since I'm not like on Twitter or other places where individual journalists stand out, um, to me, the outlet itself is the credibility, um, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I was just like, Oh, actually I'm surprised this NPR article was pretty good. I, uh, Forbes tries to put out, uh, games reviews and I haven't read yeah. one in a long time. Um, there, there's another, like, uh, there's another similar thing like in that in that ballpark. I forget what it is, but they'll occasionally came out come out with reviews, and it's just like, man, this is who did you pick? How did you and pick? That's, oh, that's only like the first time that NPR has done stuff with gaming, um, as far as I know. It's just weird that they're like trying to carve out like a niche now. It seems like really it's like really. Right. Yeah, I think the last time I remember, and this is just from personal experience because. Uh, of what happened, but the last time I remember them like reaching out for like any kind of interest for the gaming community, because I don't listen to them a lot, but I did after this happened, is when I used to work at the place that must not be named. And um, they came in at the old location and they were like, you know, getting the scoop on stuff. And I think, I'm not sure if it was like a, a local journalist or something, but she went, she did work for NPR. And um, I ended up being on the, um, oh gosh, I can't remember what it's called, but like it's the, basically their, their catch all segment where they talk about like, all of the things that are going on and all things considered all things considered thank you yeah so um the interview played during that but i was just like i didn't even know npr would like cared about gaming at all <laughs> until but then that's the thing though at least the some of the bigger conglomerates are trying to reach out in mostly the correct fashion they do say for the most part except for some of the like rolling stone sort of out of out of nowhere things but for the most part they do say hey you respect our our outlook on this or that. So maybe you would be interested in this going forward. And, and it's, it is an experiment for uh, experiment for some, uh, but at the same time, uh, reviews are, are coming because they are. <laughs> Sob said in chat, but this looks like he's about to be hunted in a found footage documentary. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my point and let it go. Um, <laughs> reviews are still an important part of the industry um, because none of us can truly keep up with all this all by ourselves. Like unless we're no living it, and, and I mean, Wait, obviously, but there's not, there, or our NAI. Like me, but yeah, there's there's not as much of a practical value to normal people to read all reviews you know if you i mean even most of the people i know who are interested in gaming don't know very much about the industry um like if there is stuff happening with workers in a studio or if there's some sort of development anything short of like a delay um most people i know don't really have any idea what's going on in the gaming industry you know it's like uh i would say similarly i 
it, I may know about some movies, but I definitely don't know most of what's going on in Hollywood, except for like really big things like the strike uh, right now and um, and things like that. But like, I don't know much about different movie studios or different individual directors beyond what I've seen firsthand um, in the things that they've made. And uh, when I when I look around at people who play games all the time, I have to remind myself that just because people like playing games does not mean that they have any interest at all in how those games are made, who the people are that made them, uh, you know, what the cultural significance of any of these conversations um, mean. Because, uh, I mean, plenty of people don't even use social media. So, like, the idea of conversation around games um, to them doesn't exist. So, to those people, uh, reviews are the one and only in that they have into games culture uh, that might actually teach them something. You know, so uh, it's, like, for the same exact reason, though. Like, that's the only in that a lot of people would have. A lot of people don't... Um, They've lost, uh, they've been what's uh, dis disenfranchised by uh, the review process, especially in the last decade when, um, you know, and we can revisit this later. I didn't mean to jump ahead, but when uh, like Gamergate happened and, and uh, you know, when uh, people now, it's very easy for people to jump in and intentionally damage the credibility of people or a studio or anything like that um, for their own personal gain. It's it's easier than ever to uh, to damage people's credibility, I think. Um, so a lot of people just avoid those reviews altogether because they're like, well, you know, I don't trust any outlet. Uh, because essentially, you know, to, to follow a greater trend in American culture, um, pe people are trusting experts less and less and less. So the idea that, um, you know, imagine that I'm Joe the Gamer and I play video games all day. Um, I probably think that I have a great understanding of gaming just across the board because I play a lot of games and, um, you know, I don't, and I don't need a college degree to have experience, but I think a lot of people don't understand, uh, you know, and again, this doesn't just apply to gaming, that, uh, journalism is a lot more than just being able to speak intelligently on a topic. Uh, there are ethical standards you need to think about. There's the fact that uh, a, a lot of casual people, when they write something on the internet, it's usually in a moment of passion. They're usually telling you when they're very excited or very upset about something, and they write a review and they move on and they don't ever have to revisit it again. But when you have someone whose job it is to do that, they have real skin in the game. They have their credibility on the line, um, you know, and they want to make a good product. I think it's important to remember that most people who create things take pride in their work and they uh naturally want to make a good product um i think a lot of people think there's some sort of uh you know something conspiratorial about experts when they write on certain things whether it's games journalists or climate scientists or anything right there's like some level of oh well this person's got some you know they were probably getting paid to say that and it's like well oh you know, you know big journal yeah like... big journal. It's like, you know, <laughs> most people are just normal people they just get paid to go to work just like you do um you know so maybe it's it's not that crazy uh but anyway uh that's all that's all a whole lot of stuff we can talk about but um but we wanted to start this with the strengths of the review process. I want to remind everyone that people who write for credible outlets are, that is their job. They are experts in their field. Um, I think the best example of, like my favorite sites always have a thing at the bottom of an article that tells you about the author. So um, as as we continue this conversation, I'll tell you some of the, the uh, things that I read today. Uh, I also, I'll shout this out again at the end of the show, but if you were like me, and you don't read a lot of things on the internet, you mostly consume things through audio, through podcasts or whatever, um, or, you know, through, through YouTube or anything like that. Um, if, if things are only written down and you want to be able to hear them, I strongly recommend using Microsoft Edge. Both the mobile and desktop apps allow you to read a web page. They also get rid of, uh, any like ads and stuff on your screen that make it really hard to read. So I Wait. strongly recommend using that. You're saying that Microsoft Edge is useful? Microsoft Edge has been useful. People just like to rage on it. I've been using Microsoft <laughs> Edge for like three years. So, you know, this is my review of Microsoft Edge. It starts now. 
Uh, Perfect no, five out of seven. They, yes, five out of seven. <laughs> uh, it really is good. So it's called like read aloud mode. I think you hit F11 or something. Um, but I really recommend that if you're someone like me who wants to read things, but doesn't always have a practical way to do it. If you're on your phone, you do have to leave the app open. You can't switch apps while it's reading. But uh, one of the apps, that, or sorry, one of the uh, reviews that I read today, I went through Starfield's graphic, one of the graphics that uh, Bethesda shared, where they're like, hey, look how much people love our game, you know, and it's tons of uh, eights, nines, and tens out of 10, and, and so on. And so I just picked at random, I picked some sites that I did not recognize, and I went and go. Uh, I went and read their reviews uh, so that I could go in with no preconceived notion of what the site was, so I could judge uh, accordingly, right? So I could judge it more fairly, I think. Um, I'll find this article here in a second, but the, the first one that I really liked had at the bottom, like a couple paragraphs on who the author was. It said, here's who the author was, here's their background, here are their interests, and you can find their other work on the website through this link. That is very important. When you're reading things that people have to say on the internet, you have to remember that they are strangers. If they have not established credibility with you, you should not trust them, period. And I think a lot of people, our age and older are very quick to trust random people with no citations. Um, you know, people saying, oh, I, I read on the internet that when actually they're about to summarize a TikTok from someone that they've never seen or heard of before. You know, that is not good credibility. It's uh, almost kind of like the same um, line of like parasocial relationships where like it's, it's that plus like the echo chamber mentality where this person is like agreeing with the things that they've already internalized as their opinion. And so they're just instantly willing to trust them like right off the bat without looking into maybe who they are as a character, um, their expertise in the field, what they do, you know, things like that, that lend them the actual credibility that they so seek to like press onto the other people that they're telling, you know, ab about, you know. Right. So I'll, I'll find that uh, site. I, you know, we have, we have a lot of stuff written here today. We did a lot of <laughs> homework this time. Well, isn't it common now for most journalists, like, like sites to do that kind of thing? I mean, I don't know if it goes as far as to give you like an entire, like, you know, biography, you know, mini biography and like a link out, but I've seen little tiny like blurbs about, you know, this author is a cozy gamer who, you know, has a pet cat named Stinky or something like that. You know what I mean? Every one of the pet cats is named Stinky. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that is definitely a, a, a parent. It is definitely part of, most sites now. I, I do want to add on here as just a, an addition to something we can talk about at a later date too, um, is that we actually got news just earlier today, by the way. Well, breaking um, news. Yeah, that with these sites, there are things happening. Uh, like today, The Onion and uh, GMG Unions, which are under the Gizmodo umbrella, uh, Gizmodo Espanol was completely replaced uh, by an AI translation service. They had multiple Spanish reporters uh, that were completely replaced by AI translation, which is not workable anyway. If, you've, if you're familiar at all with how Google Translate works, it's trash because in many, many uh, languages and, and many uh, even minor sentences, don't work correctly like the context is not there when google like all of the to... nuance of the actual language isn't there yeah, like exactly i keep there's googling a stuff lot... and and uh google's ai keeps trying to give me a summary uh, a summary of the answers and it's almost never correct it's always yeah. missing some fundamental thing like today i was trying we we use canva which is uh that's where we put our docs now it's a great tool it's a great free tool for anybody for any creator who's looking to uh, edit images or anything like that, even videos. Uh, so I was like, hey, Google, how do I do this thing in Canva? And it gave me an answer that was just like not, it, it gave information that made sense, but it did not, up, like it was telling me to click a button that just wasn't there. And then when I clicked the sources that it was pulling from, it was just missing it was misunderstanding crucial context on what it was describing. And so it's the source, very trust me, bro. We have these discussions. <laughs> it was yeah. stupid. Um, yeah, well, so, you know, it is common for journalists to, on, a, on a credible site to even have a tiny thing, like you said, some, to just say, hey, my pet's name is Stinky and I've been working at this publication for eight years. I really like uh, Western role-playing games or something. 
I promise know. I beat the captcha before posting this article. <laughs> <laughs> even, <laughs> even that is more uh, information than I can find when I watch some random person's gaming TikTok. I don't know who they are. There is nowhere unless they have their own website, which probably they don't. I don't have any way to actually check um, to do any sort of background check. You know, when I was in high school, I was lucky to have a really good. Uh, I just went. I went to a school that I'm very thankful for, and uh, one of my favorite things that I learned in history. I had some wonderful history teachers. I've talked at length on this show about how much I like history, and it's because of those teachers. Well, one of the things that I found the most important that I've applied to so many things across my life uh, is historiography. It is the study of historians. So the idea is that history is a uh, is a story that you tell. It's always told by somebody from some point of view. There's no such thing as a history without bias. It does not exist. So when someone's telling you a story, you need to be able to understand um, what their biases are, what their backgrounds are, what are they trying to convince you of, even if they are trying to be unbiased. These things are all critically important to understand the information that you're being told. And it's a skill that is clearly really lacking in American culture based on uh, the events of the past 10 years. Um, people really don't have a good understanding that um, other, other people don't have their best interests at mind. And, you know, when you ask someone a question and they like if you if you try to look into credibility and you can't find it, that should set off a red a red flag. Um, you know, fake news has been a big thing in the past decade. Um, here's a funny story I don't think I've ever told on the podcast. I very briefly uh, weaseled my way into becoming a moderator for a pro-Trump Facebook group that had tens of thousands of people in it. And um, to the, the short of it is that I didn't understand at that moment that fake news, like like actually like not not a bad in, in, you know not a uh, an interpretation that you disagree with but like actual fake news like here's a headline that is that is false that is 100% false um and here's a little blurb about it and it's really just a bad copy and paste from a real website and and you look around and all the ads are terrible like all the ads are the clickbaitiest worst things you've ever seen well i didn't really understand that that stuff was really that real i thought it was blown out of proportion and then when i got into this facebook group and was moderating i realized that um everyone was all of these people over the age of 50 were sharing articles that were just totally false completely false and none of them had any ability they had never been educated to learn how to assess credibility well, certainly not at a young age, but not when they were older either. And I think that's in this conversation of games reviews is the same thing where it's a skill that you have to use. And if you haven't been taught how to use it, then, you know, you need to go seek it out yourself because no one on the Internet is going to teach that to you. But if you just trust information that's being fed to you, it's going to be bad for everybody, you know, not just bad for you, but uh, in the context of Starfield. We've had, uh, you know, we've, Hot Rod's here in chat somewhere. Um, we were talking in the Discord this past week that some of the people that he follows on the internet um, have just been d destroying Starfield online as if it's not a pretty widely acclaimed video game that just came out. And the idea is that um, these people, I mean, my opinion is that these people uh, really want to get clicks. And so uh, the thing that gets clicks on the internet faster than anything is negative press. If you can find something to hate on, um, you're much more likely to get clicks than if you, you know, write out a very well-spoken TikTok or something. Um, so the, the issue is like uh, people will intentionally uh, misrepresent what a game is or they will uh, present their expectations, which are clearly unrealistic. Um, they'll present those expectations as real things in starfield the idea would be that uh i discovered i didn't really know this um if you just try to fly at something in space like you would in no man's sky you will never reach it um todd howard and the starfield team never said that that was something you can do that was something that i assumed that you could do so i was surprised that when we were in discord and i was talking for almost like 10 minutes 
just vibing, just like aiming my ship and boosting at this thing. And then I realized, uh, oh, I haven't moved an inch. I have to go to my map and select it and travel to that. Um, that was my expectation being wrong. And sure, I wish that it was like No Man's Sky, or at least I did in that moment. When I play more, maybe I won't care anymore. Um, but that was, my expectation was wrong. I I shouldn't put that much uh, of my uh, emotional opinion <laughs> in the disappointment of that expectation because it, because I just pulled it out of thin air. The people making the game never told me the game would be like that. It was an assumption that I made. And I think a lot of people go into their reviews, whether they're leaving something on a Steam review <laughs> or a TikTok, uh, you know, real quick, something on there. Um, they go in with their assumptions and they act like their assumptions were things that the company, you know, expressed explicitly. Uh, I'm getting off the rails here. Vilas is like checking her document and he's like, bro, what's the point of making, you know, a structure to this conversation if you're just going to talk all over the place? But, uh, you know, this whole review conversation is pretty complicated. <laughs> But uh, I think expectations, uh, both from someone who's giving a review and someone who is uh, getting a review, they're both very important. Um, Miles, you got a bunch of stuff. Let's uh, let's could we revisit some more of these strengths that you have written here? Because you you had a lot of good stuff when we were drafting up this conversation about um, like why why good reviewers are good reviewers, you know? Um, yeah. Let's see here. There's so many things. Uh, actually, I mean, I, I'll get into that, the good reviewer sort of thing. And it's it's really, there's plenty of nuance that we're not going to get into just because it'll take forever. But these these people that are generally actually doing the reviews are, for the most part, uh, in the in the mid mid to large size of content creators and, and outlets. They have the person doing the re review has the presence built up from their history and education in the field. Like we, you had mentioned that you know there, there's so many creators out there that you know have none of that. They just have I like games. I talk. You know, uh -huh. um, I'm a and, charismatic and, person who plays video games. Okay, great. Right, me right. too. But wow, <laughs> like call me out, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like like me for example, uh, if I ever take hate on it. Um, I have run multiple places that actually create games and have creative parts behind escape games. Like I know how problem solving works and, and there's a whole thing behind that and there, there's history there. Uh, but a lot of these uh, reviewers do have something in their back pocket as well, right? The best ones do, you know, if you're, if you're going to somebody um, that doesn't normally do reviews, they come out with a, a Starfield review all of a sudden uh, or they start a conversation that's that's huge all of a sudden, uh, like a particular doctor that we do not talk about, uh, that brings up horrible subjects and, and just stuff that's not actual discourse and not actual debate and not actual uh, conversation that needs to be had, then you know that that's not a that's not a helpful part of the review process. It's not a helpful part of the environment out here. Um, but there are plenty of places that, that try to do their best. Um, like I, I like sticking to to a lot of the things like The Escapist, uh, Zero Punctuation has really hilarious reviews um, that are well-founded. They do get emotional at times, but it, their their community kind of uh, gro grows in a really funny way to, they they play off of the the weird bravado slash like harshness that, uh, Yahtzee Croshaw at The Escapist brings to his videos. Mm -hmm. uh, they feed off of it in a in almost a, almost a constructive way, as opposed to the people that uh, you know follow the doctor for uh, for his hot just takes. general gameplay and hot takes, and then run with the next Twitter uh, trend. You know, yeah. Uh, like we have to keep. <laughs> to those those places that are, are offering more transparency and a an actual thematic reason why they do things uh not just taking something uh with very little context as a as a review and okay this is this is why i should or should not buy this game which that's that's kind of the the whole point that people have been forgetting is that all you do is you find 
a reviewer or a set of reviewers, uh, a, a place, a community that generally has your thoughts in mind, uh, that aligns with you and the, the things that are most important with you. And if they have that opinion, that's very close to yours generally. And they say, you know what, this didn't work out for us. Uh, then that's when it's, it's time to say, okay, well, I could, I, I could hold off buying on that. Like mm-hmm. that's, that's the point. You buy something or you don't. That's what a review boils down to in its basis form, right? Right. It's it's a unfortunately it's a binary, right? So stick to that. Well, mm, <laughs> like, I don't think it's a binary. There's like a there's a tertiary option as well. But once we get past all these all these lists and stuff, I'll elaborate more on that. Sav, is it is it when you're like, I will or won't buy this Overwatch game? Also, there's a third option where I will have chat by the battle pass. <laughs> no, no, that's the third option every time, yes. I will have someone else buy it for me. Not like this. No, what I meant was <laughs> using the review to determine whether or not you will or won't buy the game. The tertiary option is disregarding the review. Like, or, you know what I mean? See, that, that's, yeah, that's, that's just a third option in life, right? <laughs> is to choose to not do that thing, right? Uh, so yeah, if we are taking part in the review environment, the review process uh, presented to us in this industry, then uh, then yeah, that's that's the the options that we have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I I say well because like you're right in the fact that you should find like a like a review kind of community or you know society that like you align with because that'll help you decide whether or not you want to buy something but then if you read a review that maybe like of a game that you're like really really psyched for but then like the people of you know of your review tribe whatever you want to call it are like "Mm, maybe wait but like you know it deep in your heart of hearts that you would really like this entry i mean i feel like you know you don't the, the review isn't the end all be all of decision making it should be a tool with which you make your decision, not the decision maker, right? Yeah. Right. 100%. There's there's your nuance right there. Yeah. the The nuance that you can find in a review is nice because, like, when I read that, uh, the NPR review that I read gave it a seven out of ten, and it was like, "Hey, this game's got problems, but I love it." Like, it started off, and it was like, "Hey, I just want to say this game may not be." perfect but i cannot wait to finish this review and go back to playing it basically which like as i was reading it i was like these are all fair criticisms everything you're describing does sound like a seven out of ten and this definitely sounds like a game i want to buy because the fun that the reviewer clearly was having when they were describing their experience was exactly what i thought i would like too when i played and i expect to find that enjoyment when i do play you know, but like the seven out of 10 tells one story and then the I cannot wait to get back to this game um, is only one part of that story, right? Like they should, in that case, they should be read together because those are important things. But, uh, you know, to some people on the internet, the the number is the thing that matters to them. Uh, they aren't looking for nuance, you know, and if you are one of these people, you know, I may be snide about it, but it really is okay. <laughs> if you really are only looking for like a metacritic number because they do tell uh generally a fair story of how many people like this game um there's a uh you know i shared this all over our socials um today but i i went into the comment section of a clickbait article that was the the headline was basically saying um Starfield and, and Sea of Stars came out on the same week, but Starf, uh, but uh, Sea of Stars has, gosh, they both have to have stars in the name, don't they? Um, sea of Stars is uh, more highly acclaimed on Metacritic. It's in the 90s where uh, Starfield is in the 80s. Um, and so, it's, of course, it's a clickbait article, but uh, reading the comments, the, the one I pulled up, uh, let's see, I, I nicknamed the, the person who wrote this, I uh, nicknamed him Clowny McFrowny because this is a, a pretty sad, uh, goofy take here. But this says, uh, that's why I don't respect these reviews and critics. I own both games. Sea of Stars is dope, but come on, be realistic. Comparing something that looks like a damn Super Nintendo game to Starfield? Stop it. They're not even in the same class. I mean, they're right, though. Sea of Stars is better. You know? <laughs> well, they're also right that they're completely different things that don't have to be compared. <laughs> right, totally. 
you know, but the idea that like I, I was in Starfield and Odysseus uh, said the same thing as well when he was playing that that it, it took him minutes to realize that he wasn't moving and there was nowhere on the screen that pointed out, hey, you actually have to stop what you're doing and open the map. Like so far, I've hit several issues in Starfield where the UI just like wasn't telling me anything. So I was really glad that I was playing in Discord with other people because like Chrome, Lord Chrome here was uh, able to give me several hints, like tips that uh, the game should have definitely given me. But, um, you know, the the fact that this person, Clowny McFrowny, um, can't th see that Sea of Stars can be an equally or even better potentially game than Starfield uh, just because of the graphics is laughable because why would the graphic like the the thing that cracks me up that like makes me mad and laugh at the same time is that this person is citing graphics as the main reason that would uh separate the the quality of these two games but based Isn't on what that, they like said, always the case though but based on what they said they clearly have no respect for the art style at all so if you have no respect for it, like, why why did you even open your mouth? Like, why did you even begin typing in the comments section with with such vitriol? It's It just doesn't make any sense to me that someone with such a bad take would want to uh, allow other people to see that take on the internet, even if they're strangers. But um, but anyway, let's di I'll dial it back a second. Vilas, you said it's important. You both said that um, these games are totally different from each other. Uh, another article that uh, I read, uh, Vilas, you shared with me b before the show and I was doing my homework, was uh, an article from PC Gamer that said, uh, Baldur's Gate 3 has ruined Starfield for me. And if, and if you, there's a similar situation. You guys have heard me talk about how Hades completely ruined Spelunky 2 for me. And, like, and I just, if Spelunky 2, I was like, do not care about this game. Not interested. This game's not that good. Uh, but then after I came back to it later, I was like, oh, actually, this game is great. Um, you know, it's maybe a teeny tiny bit worse than than Hades. But I mean, Hades is like a top tier game. So uh, they were similar enough that I really only had room in my head for for one of those things to, to live rent free. Um, but I was not giving Spelunky 2 a fair shake. And it wasn't because that game wasn't quality. It's just that there were two competing things. And I struggled to isolate uh, one from the other in the internal dialogue that I was having. In the article, in the PC Games article of uh, Baldur's Gate versus Starfield, um, I I felt what it was saying. I appreciated the nuance in, in what this person was, was writing that was basically, hey, Starfield has a lot to offer, but this game over here did certain things so much better that I'm having trouble uh, enjoying Starfield for what it is because I'm trying to enjoy it for what this other thing is. And I think that's an important and difficult distinction to make. And I think in the in the game of the year conversations that that we have here at Party Invite in our community and that and people have um at large, it's really hard not to compare those things. You know, it's really hard to uh Vilos, you said that Celeste lost game of the year to uh to God of War 2018. <laughs> yeah. Which is just a funny <laughs> thing. Is so funny. Um, those are both very good games. But if you asked, you know, Joe Gamer on the street, uh, which one deserved game of the year, I would I would say that 80% of the people would would laugh at you for putting Celeste and God of War um on on, you know, to comparing them against each other. And most of those people would not know anything about Celeste, right? It's just you look at something like that and you naturally uh, especially because the graphics, you're like, oh, well, one is obviously higher quality than the other because look at the budget. Like, how could Celeste be game of the year when it looks like a Super Nintendo game? Um, you know, and for, again, people who who don't read reviews, who don't pay attention to the gaming industry at large, um, they have probably never experienced a game, you know, that looks like Sea of Stars, for example, or Celeste or Spelunky, all games that look like... Uh, modern super nintendo games and i say that with love in my heart you know they look great they are the pinnacle of this pixel art um that started so many years ago but but it's even better now it's the best it's ever been not just in the stills but also in the animations uh and then not to mention any of the other things like game mechanics and writing um you know but there's so much to enjoy but a lot of people they can only see the simplest versions of things and because they don't read 
game reviews, they don't know either the merits of these underdogs um, or the wider conversation of how games are made or, uh, you know, why do so many people like Sea of Stars? Um, you know, why is it almost unanimously positively reviewed when other games with equally big budgets that are well-reviewed, uh, you know, don't have quite the same Metacritic score uh, as the other ones. Uh, I've, I've mentioned Metacritic a few times. For anybody who's not familiar with Metacritic, it's an aggregate site that just takes all of the reviews from everywhere else and puts them all in one place. So Metacritic doesn't actually review games themselves. Um, they just take reviews that everyone else has given, usually with a number score, uh, and puts them all in one aggregate place. So, I think um, more over to that, the people see like the simplified graphics, you know, the Super Nintendo graphics or whatever, and they just, they liken that with something like childish because right. that's what they grew up playing, right? And I think that gives more to like the thought process of, oh, well, that's childish. Of course, it's not gonna be better than Starfield because look how mature it is with all of its, you know, three updated 3D graphics and stilted conversation about mature topics such as, did you get that delivery from space? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like childish, games i mean if if you are one of the people to fault a game for being childish and don't think that it deserves the accolades it's getting look at splatoon 3. it won best Oops. multiplayer game of the year over call of duty modern warfare 2 the reboot the sequel the reckoning electro boogaloo and knuckles. um and knuckles and watch <laughs> but like the, the splatoon 3 won best multiplayer game of the year what was that 2022 right so and sure. i mean Call of Duty was like one of the games that put like the M rating on the map, you know, besides the actual one that did, which is Mortal Kombat. You know, that's the one notoriously GameStop. Oh, is there violence in this game? Yes, ma'am. It's about army people shooting at each other. Yes, there's violence. There's like, so that's like one of the quote unquote most mature games out there that you can surmise to be much mature. And then this childish quote unquote cartoony game, Splatoon 3 beats it out. I mean, that's, that's not... The conflation that cartoony is childish is just, it's its not there. It's a non-issue, really. And then, not to mention, I think Splatoon 1 won Game of the Year the year it came out over, gosh, I don't even remember the candidates for that, because that was, like, so long ago now. Mm -hmm. But that's, that, my point is that, you know, simple doesn't mean worse. Childish doesn't mean worse. Right. You know, and uh, I don't know, the idea, I sometimes forget, this is an example of my own, blind spots, but I, I often forget that a lot of people do uh, equivocate gaming in general with with children, you know, and I just forget that. I'm just like, oh, right. You, if you've never been around someone who's played a game in 30 years, then yeah, I guess you would think that games are for children. But at that point, I'm like, why am I even talking to you? <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. Why are you in my house? <laughs> How dare you speak to me? <laughs> Valus, you look like you'd be saying that right now, like literally. Listen, I, <laughs> I cannot control my lighting situation and the camera. It just is doing what it wants to do. It is spooky ghost. Uh, so is that ghost. Oh, he's probably back there, knocking around. You know, jump scare. Uh, right <laughs> for it. Uh, what else do we have? Okay, so we uh, clowny McFrowny with his stupid <laughs> uh, Super Nintendo comparison. Um, Baldur's Gate 3 has ruined Starfield for me. I dropped a link for that in chat. Um, there's, a, there's a great article from Kotaku. It says, Armored Core 6 as uh, as told by Steam Reviews. Um, I'll drop that in chat as well. It's pretty funny uh, because the game has like an 85% positive review um, on on Steam. But when you watch the negative, when you read the negative reviews, it has like all of the examples of why you shouldn't trust reviews that were written in five seconds you know um just <laughs> lots of goofy stuff you know where's the easy mode uh you know somebody who was like i bought the game because i heard it was made by the people who made elden ring and as soon as i saw a mech on screen i refunded the game it's like how could you be so <laughs> misinformed why would you spend 60 dollars with no information like there's like a half dozen images like right there on the page before you even get to the button like come on man there's so many um what else do we have i oh, oh we're just talking about nuance and reviews and metacritic uh scores aggregate scores so uh for the people who only look at numbers there is value in that metacritic score 
you know, I, I think numbers are way less valuable than the explanation for those numbers. But uh, one of the other malicious things that people do, which make it difficult for the rest of us to find um, good information, is uh, review bombing. Um, a couple of you mentioned it here in chat uh, that Metacritic is a great place to review bomb places. Well, Steam is too. Uh, Overwatch 2 is the uh, most poorly reviewed game of all time on Steam, which is uh, frustrating. That's a feat, actually. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, boy, it's really all you need is something common to hate. Um, but it's frustrating that like Overwatch 2 is a good game. It's a good game. But the those numbers would make you think that the game is not good. People are review bombing the game for plenty of reasons, like, you know, the the game was promised to have PvE, and it's not going to be the same as what was originally promised. Is that frustrating? There are too many yeah. alphabet people! <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> people complaining about Starfield, review bombing Starfield because it's woke, which really just means that in the character creator, you can choose your pronoun. Wow. Do not there get me started about that. that you, had. you know, but <laughs> literally, uh, but years. when people review games like that, um, it makes it more difficult to understand where the the useful information is because they're intentionally uh, flooding the the internet with with false information or uh, misinformation, um, and that stuff's really frustrating because if you're just trying to figure out whether a game is worth playing, things like that. Um, are harmful and of course that's the point is to be harmful but um but that's really frustrating so there there was a game um i s forgot to look up the name of it help me out chat if you can remember but there is a co-op card based roguelike that I, sh I i brought up a couple times in the past six months um i can't remember what it's called but uh whatever it is the the game seems good according to all the reviewers the game is worth playing especially if you like roguelikes if, if you don't like card games or roguelikes you're probably not going to like this card based roguelike uh shocker but um pretty much everybody agreed that the game was good but it has like a 54 percent mixed review uh on on steam because everyone is very upset about how little content there is in the dlc for the price that doesn't mean anything to me i want to know if the game is worth buying you know, so a 54% mixed review is a bad review. That's, that's alarming. Like, that's the reason I haven't picked up the game yet. Um, but that's frustrating because when you, when you read why people have negatively reviewed it, it's like, oh, right, this is garbage. This is like maybe a valid point, but not the, not the, um, constructive place to make that point. Uh, because to, to casual people, this makes it looks like the game is bad, but you all agree in the, you know, two sentence reviews that the game is actually good. So, you know, there's that, that's where your spectrum is nuance on in the way of like uh, a journalist reviewing a game uh, in the middle is the is the Metacritic aggregate review. And then on the right side is all of the bullshit on Steam or review bombing um, that just completely uh, ruins the experience for everybody else, including the developer. You know, uh, it's also important to remind, just as an aside, that a lot of times, um, you know, th imagine that you developed this game, the card-based game I'm talking about that I can't remember the name of. Imagine that you developed this game and then the, the game completely bombs on reviews because of a marketing decision. You know, you made this great game, you made exactly the game you wanted, and then the marketing team, or more likely the CEO or something, uh, made a bad decision and then your game completely fails and gets bad reviews as a result. You know, it's just, it's a dishonest review process. Um, we've all seen it, you know, it's up to each of us to make sure that we're clicking things to, to read the context, um, of, of what those things mean, but, but it is frustrating, you know? So, uh, I would say one thing that is important when you do see good things, make sure to share those, you know, we have the bliss up segment at the top of the show because, uh, Good news doesn't get shared as often as bad news. Across the board, humans love bad news. You know, most people will click about, uh, will click into an article about a house burning down before uh, they'll click into, you know, uh, a nonprofit doing something wonderful. And that's just the way it is. But I would say that if you're in this community and you know RMO here, uh, when you see good, honest, constructive reviews or just anything on the internet that people have created, um, share it, you know, because, uh, for a lot of us, I mean, you know, Vilos, you, you've spent, well, but two of you have spent more time on Twitter 
than I have uh, by by a long, long shot. And Twitter has plenty, you know, it's not even called fucking Twitter anymore. Don't even get me started. But, uh, you know, there are plenty of good things about Twitter, about that space. But for, you know, a delicate flower like me, it's really hard to load up the website and find those things because the first things that the algorithm gives me is is all negative stuff. So all of the good, wonderful things that are out there that people are creating on Twitter, I don't even see because of all because of the barrier between me and those things. So just like the review process, if I'm likely to discover something new that I've never seen, it's probably going to come from one of you two or someone here in chat. You know, uh, I highly value the the people whose opinions I know pretty well, the people I trust. Um, and if you guys share something, then I will see it. But if the people I trust don't share something, then I probably won't see it. So I would just encourage people that if you see those things out in the world, hit that share button. Like sharing uh, the good things that, that people make, especially small creators, is tremendously helpful to those people. You know, even even one share in the right place can straight up change someone's career. I know writers for, for some of the podcasts I listen to um, have had their careers basically started uh because a few people shared their their stuff and and it went viral you know and i i love seeing those stories but ah uh, i'm gonna take a deep breath here <laughs> like like <laughs> shouting out demo duo right now because you know their vods are are gonna be out for sea of stars and some other great stuff so yeah uh, it's, they it's did, very important to they did stuff. uh a review last week uh they played uh immortals of avium avium Avium. yeah i think uh and if it wasn't for them i just wouldn't care about that game at all i wouldn't know anything about it but um they are wonderful and the game seemed cool it just came out at a time where it was competing with a lot of heavyweight titles you know um but that was a, a wonderful thing and i'm so glad i listened to it because i walked away with a much more positive um idea of that game and a constructive uh you know constructive outlook than i would have if i hadn't oh my gosh oh okay Sorry, kitty. I keep forgetting my cat hangs out underneath my desk. Um, that scared me. <laughs> Jump scare. Uh, yeah, Demo Duo is wonderful. Uh, you know what? Uh, Lord Chrome's here in chat. He's been playing a bunch of stuff. I've been watching him play Starfield while uh, I was waiting for it to appear on Game Pass. Um, Lord Chrome's good people. Uh, Sav, you got your, your stuff over on your channel. Just good vibes. You uh, mentioned at the top of the show, you know? Uh, we got Odysseus. I mean, honestly, damn, we got the whole stream team in here, actually. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of good people in here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, well, what else am I missing now that I've, like, now that I've spoken for, like, 20 minutes straight? I need to, I need to shut up. I need to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did go through a few reviews here. The, um... Oh, I just wanted to point out Clowny McFrowny is now going to be my name for any dumbass <laughs> reviewer, like anybody online who just has a, a stupid take, like a clearly ignorant take. Clowny McFrowny. Clowny McFrowny. And even though we are, we are uh, still pointing out the positive things with reviews, uh, I do want to say it, you are very thankful that you have not seen this last week and a half of Twitter because it's all trash. It's, it has been such a dumb place to be uh, lately. Um, Including like uh, Alana Pierce was credited for uh, getting the explanation out about the whole planet travel thing uh, in Starfield. Uh, she kept stream on like as she slept. Even it was like a like eight to twelve hour stream or something like that, where yeah. she just had her ship going, and she thought it was going uh, to planets. Uh, oh no! And it it for the most part was in certain aspects but there, there's there's more to it um but at, at the end like she finally did get to a couple planets but like she got back up into the stream and uh like when she got to pluto like you literally passed through pluto like oh, there wasn't no. even a chance to really like land on it at the oh, time rip. But, like, it was just like a visual element instead of like an interactable asset <laughs> basically yeah i'm surprised it um, even let her move <laughs> they, like to even go there uh, yeah, since, but, well, that's funny. But she, so she you can actually open. travel to these planets without navigating the map. It just to takes agree, forever. It's just it just yeah, takes forever it's, it's and, and doesn't work. So, <laughs> yeah. and doesn't work. It's not consistent. <laughs> um, but, but there are 
Twitter uh, led to obviously people uh, trying to get her to lose her job, uh, and she put out a YouTube video on that today. So That's, that makes sense. It's no. yeah, it all makes perfect sense because it's the perfect world. Of, on those Twitter. people that were berating her were probably just uh, worried about journal, uh, sorry, ethics and journalism. Um, that's probably what they're worried about. <laughs> Obviously, yeah. Um, but yeah, we've we've highlighted a few uh, cool reviewers. Uh, that's always fun. I, I haven't gotten to see uh, the Escapist review of Starfield. Actually, I don't know if it's for sure out. Um, but I did want to point out that you know there are still some outlets that are generally more well-regarded that actually still have uh, in-progress reviews, which is another key point that is happening lately. Uh, IGN's tried it, but honestly, for their ad numbers, like they went back to their old ways for the most part. They don't do so many in-progress things anymore. Um, but in-progress reviews are so much more helpful uh, than than just you know rushing stuff out, even though, again, we're getting more time with these games. Uh, before release, before the embargo gets up. Uh, but I, I think it was um, for Starfield, it was I Giant guess. Bomb for sure had an in-progress. There were two or three other big outlets that had in-progress reviews. Um, rock, Paper, Shotgun. There we go, Rock, rock Paper, Shotgun uh, was another one. And so they were definitely, uh, you know, something to, to get more excited about uh, in the field of reviews at the end of the day. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I say this as a joke, but, uh, you know, it's like the <laughs> early access of games reviews. <laughs> uh, yeah. But it really, there is real value in that because um, we, we were talking off stream that, uh, you know, when you go into a game that you know, you know you're going to be spending 30 or 50 or over 100 hours in, it is, in my opinion, disingenuous to play for five hours and say that you've seen enough of the game. There are, you know, that is not a black and white hard line there because that's definitely not going to apply to all situations. But, you know, I feel like in a game like Baldur's Gate or Starfield or, uh, I mean, any of the JRPGs that you've played, Vilos, like if, if you were... If you were even to play less than 10 hours, I would not say that you have a good grasp of everything that the game has to offer. You know, Honestly, that could just be the tutorial of the character creator. Exactly. Kinda, I mean, <laughs> the, the Starfield tutorial is supposed to be three to four hours long before you actually get into the area uh, where, yeah. where you can make your own decisions. Stop. Don't, don't, no, don't worry about that. <laughs> the, the look on your novel. face is, you know, it's, don't worry about it. it. It seems like a good, I'm already like an hour or something in. Of course, I play everything really slowly. Um, but, you know, it feels like I'm actually doing things. It doesn't feel like it's just holding my hand, uh, just putting me in a shooting range, you know? Um, so it's not a bad thing. But if, if someone only played the first five hours of Starfield and then reviewed it, they wouldn't know anything about the game. They would kind of know how, to, how the basic systems work. But, uh, you know, they would spit out a review. They would maybe put a number on it. And then they'd move on. And a lot of people would see that ill-informed review and that would be the only thing they saw and they'd say oh man these developers lied to us you know or you know something equally and that's another that's another point for the reviewers credibility like it's totally fine to be like wow this game sucks right now when you're five hours in and you're just you're not getting what you expected but see there's a key phrase is right now exactly the right now so the right now doesn't mean i'm gonna put that in my review that means Okay, I'm. I'm. It's a mental marker for five hours in so far. You know, it's it's not. I <laughs> like I, the 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 Twitter. My first impressions. I got 140 characters. It sucks right now. Like, bro, yeah. come on. Uh, you know, or or people. You're talking about um, you know, people rushing their reviews because um, you know, it, even if you're in the industry and you got an advanced copy. You still probably have to rush to play it. And I've heard, uh, you know, I remember reviews years ago on Giant Bomb where somebody was like, okay, well, I've, I still haven't been the game, but I've played, you know, 40 hours of Metal Gear Solid 5 or something. I don't know how long that game is. Um, you know, and, and I played a whole lot and, and I'm almost done with my review, but man, I am just, whew, this is, I've been barely sleeping, you know, and, uh, good for them if they're willing to do that for their job and stuff, but, like there's a level of binging a game 
to get a review out that colors your experience with the game so that your review is like, hey, by the way, this is my experience with the game if you play it for 50 hours in a week, you know, which is not- It's almost like tinged with the burnout. Totally, you know, because it's like you, imagine that your work pays you to do overtime for something and yeah, they did compensate you and you make that clear in the work that you're doing, but not everybody's gonna take that into account you know, when, when they're reading your review. So anyway, so there's, there's responsibility on both sides to communicate that. But, uh, now we do have more opportunities to, uh, let, let that breathe a little bit. Journalists get, uh, advanced copies in most cases earlier than ever. Vilas mentioned that earlier. Um, I really do like this trend of paying more to get a game early. As far as early act, like, as far as like, perks go for paying more i love it because in my opinion the people who are willing to pay more for a game to get it early are more likely to give um an opinion on it that reflects the actual game so like violence if, if you let's say hypothetically that you ordered that you paid extra money and expected to get your uh copy seven days in advance and not actually one day after everyone else like best buy sent you oh wait did i say this is hypothetical um anyway let's pretend uh actually you know what let's for this example because this is actually that's super damn frustrating that best buy messed up your order so badly that you couldn't play early when you paid for it Vilas. pour one out um let's say that you and i both bought advanced copies Yours didn't arrive on time. Mine did. I got to play it for a whole week before you did, right? Um, I'm obviously going to have extra knowledge about the game before you've even set your hands on it. But let's say another week goes by. So now it's a week after the game has been released to everybody. You've had it for one week. I've had it for two weeks. I have had a more, more of an opportunity to more slowly play it at my own pace, at a reasonable pace. Um, we're both going to experience different things because this is a game that's all about making your own decisions and stuff. But because I had more time to let that breathe, I think my review is going to be more useful to the people who are going to read it than yours would be if all things were equal. You're better at writing reviews, so let's just make that clear that your review would be better. But for the sake of this uh, hypothetical, um, my review yeah. would have more time to breathe. And so I really like that games have more opportunities, not just for journalists, but for regular people to get their hands on this game that they love enough to pay extra for to get early. I really like that that, that, that opportunity exists um, because in a world of, you know, I play a lot of early access games, games that never leave early access. They're in early access for seven years, you know? <laughs> Splitgate. <laughs> Gosh, Splitgate and Project Zomboid and I mean, seven days. That just stuff. makes it funnier that Baldur's Gate 3 is still getting this kind of, like, praise because I'm sure a good third of the people that are talking about it still are the people that have been playing it for over two years. Right. That have, yeah, yeah. Many hours in the bank. Uh, Cram mentions Gunfire Reborn in the comments. Cram uh, mentions Star Citizen. That one's stupid that one is stupid. Stupid. Someone doesn't seven days to sense. die um, apparently is also as well yep that's yeah. according to Odie. permanently in alpha it's an alpha but build Star 21 Star Citizen, uh has like either hundreds of millions or maybe a billion dollars in funding something something ridiculous excuse it's it's, it's another thing it's, to look up later, yeah it's a yeah. damn scam lord chrome's got it right it's wild. let me see if i can find it with a quick google here uh but yeah, they it, recently released numbers on it. Yeah, yeah. I'll find it if I look around for a bit more. We'll save that uh, for in a minute. Uh, well, hey, um, is there anything else we've we can, missed? This is. Uh, we could definitely get into into Sav's main point, um, since that's representative of a good number of our community too. I'm sure. Hear that? Yeah, actually, uh, Chrome was basically talking to the chat, and I was just like, "Are you like looking at what I have written in our document right now? Because you are literally saying the words." Like you're mm -hmm. taking them right out of my mouth. Um, but we, I mean, we, we talked about all that, you know, the goods and the bads. And I mean, the bads were kind of weaved in there, but we did talk about them. But then that tertiary option does exist about just completely disregarding reviews and doing your own thing, which is something that I've abided by since, you know, I could read magazines because I used to get like the Game, Game Informer magazines in the mail. Um, I would get them because I liked to... I literally got them for the pictures, not the not the article. Oh, well. So, and, I mean, sometimes they would have, like, really cool stuff, like, you know, fan-submitted art and things like that. And, you know, they'd do, like, shout-outs to, like, you know, sp specific, like, local events that would happen. They would, like, you know, shout them out and stuff. And I, I really appreciated that stuff, too. But 
they also you featured, you know, the main feature, which is reviews. It's called Game Informer. They were there to inform about games. <laughs> you know, that's what they did. But I never actually like read any of them, you know? Um, and I whenever, you know, the big sites started taking off, like, you know, Giant Bomb and, and Rock Paper Scissor or Rock Paper Shotgun and all that stuff, Destructoid. Um, I I didn't really pay attention because they would have all of this text and all of that text would lead up to is a giant number at the bottom. And, you know, with like little bullet points about, you know, whatever, like TLDR in, in the article. And I'm just like, okay, well, that number does not align with anything that you said in this thing. So like, why, why all that text? What, what's, what was the purpose here? And so to me, it was like, well, I'm done trying to decipher what you mean by all of this giant wall of text. I'm going to just do what I do. And I know what I, I already know what I like, right? Nobody knows what I like better than I do. Well, there might be like one or two people, um, one of which is my mother. And we're basically the same person, so she doesn't count. She's but <laughs> gonna call you up and be like, hey, this game Close. came out. Oh. I heard that you were trashing it and actually you're going to love it. So you need to <laughs> Except for like in a heavy northeastern black scent. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like when all of the reviews seem to do, especially nowadays, especially nowadays, is like call this big negative stir, like in the gaming zeitgeist, like it sours the taste in so many people's mouths. People who are like anticipating these games, wanting to like get their hands on them, and then they see, you know, Joe Schmo just reaching into the pot of negativity for clicks and engagement because that's all that sells anymore. You know, nobody, hardly anybody gives like an honest review anymore. They all just want to like either review bomb it or like naysay all the bugs and stuff, or they're another clowny McFranny like you exemplified earlier. Like it's just too much negativity. I don't want to have to devote any more of my energy or time to it. And so I'm just like, oh, this game looks like it has things on my bingo card. Like we have the bingo card system in Party Invite. I mean, it's a meme, but it's there. You know, we can generally pick out the things of each other's like likes and dislikes on a game. Like Tegan, you'll always be like, oh, Vilas, I saw this and, you know, I think you'll like this and then things like that. It's, mm-hmm. It happens a lot. And I think it happens a lot on the pod too. Oh, like you'll yeah, be like, oh, Vilas, Vilas uh, pointed this game out to me and, you know, the, all this stuff. It's like our bingo cards exist for a reason. Why trust some stranger on the internet with maybe not even any credibility at all to, to discern what I like for me? Like, who? What? I don't think so. <laughs> like I'm a if if I like a game that a reviewer online says is bad, I guess they could just be mad about it because I don't care. I'm gonna have my yeah. fun. I'm gonna buy the game or get it on Game Pass for free, which is another thing. Like all these people paying money for early access and whatnot when they could just do it for free on Game Pass and then play that way. I mean, I, I understand oh if gosh. it's like you you Soft. get like the advanced copy. What my my friend don't don't mention their name. I mentioned it somewhere else, but don't mention their name. My friend bought Baldur's Gate for themselves and their partner. Played it for four hours, hated it, tried to refund it, and they were already past the refund period. And that's a $60 game, $120 you just spent, and you hate it. And I just want to be like, why didn't you read any reviews or ask me about it at all? <laughs> like, uh, wh- I know you. <laughs> I know you. I know like, you. <laughs> I know your bingo card. <laughs> oh my gosh. But I just, I just read that and I was just like, I filled wow. this out earlier this year for you. <laughs> <laughs> and Baldur's Gate is look, not on look here. The list, and then you pull like the chart, like Kronk does down from Emperor's New Groove, just like here, look. <laughs> oh my gosh! So yeah, yeah, it's you know, it's my own personal struggle to be like, oh my gosh, my friend, you know, this is my area my of expertise. <laughs> what are you? Um, but uh, I mean, it's not like we have a podcast that's specifically devoted to this kind of thing. Like, <laughs> no, you know, if only, if only. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I would say, um. Something that is important here is like, you know, you said, why would you trust a stranger? Um, you know, what would a stranger know better than me, you know, myself or my friends? Um, I think something that's important that a lot of people overlook is that a lot of the bigger um, outlets, uh, you know, the more established ones, the IGNs, the Polygons, the Game of Rumors, the world, um, they publish what their review process is. And people act like this is not public information and it's, just maddening but they publish how that they come to their review scores and what they've done for years is that uh someone at least one someone will play a game do a write-up and share it with the team internally and then the team the whole entire team essentially will then say hey based on what you've told us this sounds like an eight out of ten so the person who writes the review usually doesn't pick the number they write their review as fairly as they can 
give it to the team. And then the team is like, based on everything that you've given us, this is what this score seems to be. And I think that's more fair because it means it's like peer reviewing in a, it's like a scientific paper. It says, hey, this one person doesn't reflect the whole entire outlet. The whole outlet has a stake in this. So everyone kind of peer reviewed this game review. And I think there's value in that where, uh, like, if you find a specific person, especially in the industry who tends to uh, match up with your reviews, you should follow that person specifically, not just the outlet. Like, maybe you like that outlet because they work there. But I think there's the most value in finding individuals who reflect the style and maybe the taste that you like. On on the radio station here that I love so much and I'm always talking about, um, there are tons of great DJs, but there's one DJ in particular that like when she plays stuff, when she recommends something, I almost always like what she recommends. Like if 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 every DJ at, at the station told me their favorite album of the year, the one I'm going to listen to first is hers because I almost always align with her values or with her, the things that she likes. You probably just heard a motorcycle outside. Um I thought that was by Lucy's ghost. That was like, 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 I heard it in one ear. That was fucked up. Like, um, sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, it's all about finding the people that you align with, whether you know them personally or not. You know, maybe it's a reviewer on YouTube. Maybe it's someone uh, on you know who writes on a website. But um, I think there is the most value you can find in reviews is finding a specific person who matches the the tone and taste and. Um, the values that, that you really like in the industry. Find one individual that you like and branch off from there. Don't judge a whole outlet on something that you read five years ago because half the staff might not even work there anymore. You know, the person that wrote that might not even work there. Um, so I think I think you're just doing yourself a disservice if you are not revisiting places to see if they've changed or to see if you've missed something. Um, but to your point, Sav, I would say the thing that makes me most likely to play a game is one of you guys recommends it or somebody in our community is like, yo, Tegan, I know what you're into. Check this out. You know, I love it when somebody tags me or DMs me and is like, yo, check out this, uh, this roguelike or this survival game or something. We should play this. Um, you know, it feels good because it means that people have not only listened to, to like the things that I've liked, but they recognize something out in the world and knew that it would bring joy and shared it with me, which is just the best feeling, you know? So when people do that to you, you should respect that and you should, uh, you should appreciate and you should share it. Even if you don't know that person personally, um, you know, retweet the good shit in the world. That's what, uh, <laughs> a famous philosopher said. Um, I am glad that you brought up that peer review process and stuff, because not only do not like a lot, of, not a lot of people know that that happens, but it speaks to, um, the point that I was going to talk about next, which is that I do like opinion pieces, which are different in my opinion, huh? Then um reviews are because opinions are written like they don't have like this thing to like try and get a score on the screen you know mm -hmm. and it's not seen through this corporate lens of trying to get content out it's not trying to be timely there's no rush or anything like that opinion pieces come out when they're meant to and are written from what i assume is like the heart because this person obviously felt like this way about this game which inspired them to get it and play through it and then you know they give all of their opinions on it like that um I just think that it's more honest. It's more individual. They're not like trying to get this score out there. They're not being peer reviewed. They are, this is my line of thought. This is my opinion from my time on the game, unfettered by like a time frame, a deadline or anything like that, crunch mm -hmm. time. This is how I feel. This is what I, this is what I liked. This is what I didn't like. I really appreciated, you know, like the artistry, the cinematography. I didn't think the writing was that great. Something like that. Um, without any of the the consequence behind it, like a score. Yeah. And I, I do love stuff like that because dif differing or aligning opinions um, and perspectives are, I think, more entertaining when they aren't hindered by those kind of parameters. Because it's like they can, I, I feel like they can be more open about what, like more frank about what they're trying to say, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's not sugar-coated or, gosh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Sacrament. I, I mean... I mean, saccharine, it, is saccharine is a good word. It's not the word I'm looking for, but sugarcoated kind of gets there. You know what I mean? It's like they're they're trying to like soften the blow because they don't want to upset like the, you know, the big journal. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. You know, there is an awkward thing if you were sent a review copy 
by the developer and then you didn't like it, you know? Um, then that is absolutely something you should take into account when you're reading an article. Most, any good outlet will tell you that. They, they will say that they got the review. You know, and I like Steam reviews do that too. They, they're like, hey, I received this for free. Um, it'll also say like, hey, this person's played for 15 hours, but they gave the review two hours in or something. Um, there was another thing. Oh, the, the, uh, specifically to your point, the opinion article, not a review article, but the opinion article that said Baldur's Gate 3 ruined Starfield for me, that was especially useful to me having played Baldur's Gate, where I was like, okay, I am familiar with this because this isn't just a review exclusively about Starfield. Uh, it's a lot of comparisons. And since I do know more about Baldur's Gate, I actually have a better understanding of Starfield because of all the comparisons that this person brought up. And that was only pro uh, possible because it wasn't a review, like where they needed to put a score on it. And they right. were citing specific... Or like just specific like uh, talking points or anything, like go down the check the check boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so yeah, I, I'm with you there. I think my favorite my favorite games articles are not reviews at all. They're actually just opinion articles. Um, you know, and sometimes those opinions will come out months even after a game has has released. Um, but I think there's a lot of value in that. There are also a lot of people like us who um, buy games well after release or or buy them and, and don't play them till way, way later. You know, I still haven't played Cyberpunk 2077, but I can't wait because it's now the best game that it's ever been. And, and people are writing about that and saying, hey, this game's good. And if you haven't picked it up, like there's never been a better time. I love that stuff. Uh, well, what else? Uh, chat, if you have anything that uh, a review that you've read recently, opinion or uh, an official review with a number score, uh, let us know. Even if you didn't like one, it's always useful to look at something and identify uh, the setbacks as well as the, uh, uh, the strengths. But how are we looking, y'all? I, I think we've covered a whole lot. I know we're going to save for another day the uh, the huge conversation of um, how when you compare games, like we've said, um, that a lot of indies tend to get uh, snubbed because people look at them and don't put them in the same basket as other Game of the Year contenders. Uh, we're definitely going to talk about that on, on another show because we oh, not, definitely before December. Yes, definitely sure. before December. Um, cause yeah, as soon as, as soon as we approach, uh, December, we got the game awards, which always, December, <laughs> December. <laughs> uh, which, you know, always, always strong opinions there. Um, I will be more interested in the dialogue this year more than most, um, just because of all the things that we've seen, you know, um, this specific example that I would bring up as far as indies is, uh, I wonder where Dave the Diver is going to stand up on on all this. Dave the oh, Diver, gonna be pretty dude, Dave the Diver better be on Game of the Year lists, uh, but especially the Game Awards, just because of what that represents in the industry, freaking better be on that list. I don't know if it yeah. will be, but it better be. Uh, and and without getting like really deep into it, that's that's one of the pieces of conversation that I was thinking about when when developing this topic was that it's because the game of the year discussion has so many check boxes and it, the games that can check the most check boxes are the ones that are that continue to get talked about so when when you're looking at um you're looking at sea of stars it's like okay well the quality of a game of the year is there but it's quote unquote just a retro jrpg mm -hmm. right it's not checking more than like three boxes for for most people at any time it's like Great art, check. Uh, story, decent, check. <laughs> and that's Maybe about it. it. <laughs> yeah. So, so the majority. Wait, how much water? How much water is there in it, though? There's actually a lot of water. And is there too much? Terrible. Water too wet. There is not too much. Not, not too much water. Okay, then not a seven point five out of ten. Got it. Oh yeah. Water too wet. <laughs> Thanks, Adrian. <Adrienne. laughs> <laughs> they will never live that down. They will never live that down. Wait, what game was that? What are you talking about? I believe it was Alpha Sapphire, Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire, the remake of Ruby and Sapphire, which is notoriously known for literally having too much water. It's so island based. And like two thirds of the game is locked behind Surf. You can't access the rest of the world until you get Surf. So I mean, yes, it's a valid complaint. It was but, a significant like, portion of the game. Yeah. It is. And, and then after that, even after right. you get Surf, there's even more that you have to do that you can only do once you get the dive HM, which is also the quickest canceled HM in all of Pokemon history, because it never returned wow. as an HM. <laughs> Canceled. 
Oh, was it the OG? Was it the original Ruby Sapphire? No. Cody, <laughs> fuck time. For sure, though. Like, that was the most useless thing in a Pokemon game possibly ever. Like, I like, the, I get, I get the idea behind the exploration, the adventure of it all, and it was really cool, I guess. But I guess. like, all of all of the water, which, like I said, again, is a valid complaint. I don't know if I would mention that as a, a main reason for seven point five in a game. <laughs> I mean, um, that was at a time when we were getting strategy guides for every single one of the Pokemon games. Oh, like, don't listen to those strategy like guides. To, no, those I mean, that was like a thing to do. Like, you wouldn't have to worry about the map when you're actually in the water. It's like, oh, I'll just fucking go into the guide and be fine. I lost like, all faith like, in strategy guides after the Smash Bros. 64 uh, Prima strategy guide said that Jigglypuff's downbeat didn't do anything. Like, literally, I think the text, the actual text verbatim from that is, because it's like so ingrained in my brain. I could I, probably still get it wrong though it's like do not use this move like quote unquote do not use this move it does not do anything jigglypuff simply falls asleep <laughs> how many tournament wins does that have like under the and belt? i'm just like oh honey and that was the day that sav never got her trust back for reviews she said uh, no no that's, that means, that's strategy guys that's different well you know it's it's all the same it's it, you know i guess you're not wrong can you trust yeah. anybody um, well, so I guess we should end the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's funny. Uh, you know, the only time, the only time I've had a, uh, review guide was for, or I mean, a, uh, a game guide was, uh, Majora's Mask. And, uh, that one was pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, yeah. Ending on a high note, Odysseus, that's, uh, that's all we do here. Um, we listen up so that we can, uh, so we don't let um, you down. Yeah um no uh hey we didn't make this podcast two hours look at that hey that's right uh you know we're getting there but uh <laughs> thanks everybody well, if, you want, if we want to hit the two hour deadline let me tell you about my day so first i woke up and uh, then no, <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll recount uh how much gold i was given in diablo again uh just for kicks um no thank you everybody for uh for tuning in um we're gonna we're gonna keep up this uh back and forth where as as best we can we're gonna um focus on a party topic one week and what we've been playing the next week um you know as best we can we'll see um but uh this format gives us more opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into our topics we can also announce to you guys uh those topics a little further ahead of time so if you'd like to be involved in that process um we'd love to see that a bunch of you you know the same reason that we trust your reviews in our community is the same reason that uh you have val valuable input that we'd love to share on the show so whether uh whether that's something that you've been playing that you'd like us to share or uh, one of the topics that we're going to dive into, like these indies getting snubbed in the game of the year uh, processes for the future, um, let us know. The best place to reach us is really our Discord. That's my favorite place on the whole internet. But you can access all of our stuff on our website at partyinvite.games. You can find... Uh, Sav, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your new Twitch handle that everybody can find you at? That would be twitch.tv slash obsidianite and it is spelled exactly as it sounds. Just kidding. Um I will put it I will put a link in the chat, but um for anyone curious who is listening and not in the chat, it is O B S Y D I A N Y T E. Da -da -da -da. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, there's like a, there's like a, a there's like a rhythm there. Like, yeah. I need to hire like a jingle maker. <laughs> I love it. Um and uh yeah, and you we're also on Facebook, we're on uh we're on Twitter, we're on all that good stuff. Um we are going to end the show here, but we're going to be back for Starfield in just a few minutes. Uh, Sav's not going to be able to join us, but Vilos will be uh, a ghost in chat. Um, just like the ghost in his apartment, perhaps which literal. I'm still waiting for. Yep. <laughs> like, that some chains or something. Right. The, the light back there is getting a little bit more foreboding, so yeah. Ooh, spooky. All right. What, what does the ghost think about reviews? I want to know. <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, stick around and chat. We'll be back again. And for everybody listening from the future, we'll see you again next Thursday. Bye. Bye. Bye.